thank you for this unique privilege, I think. She is very convincing. So I was told I should tell a personal story. So I tell stories all day because I work in the museum as a docent and I tell other people's stories. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about myself. <clears throat> so the, the title of this story is, I don't know how my dad got so smart. <laughs> so I think I'll start when I was like seven. And um, I, I think I need to describe my dad a little bit then You'll, you'll start to get a clue. So my, my dad looks like me, only he's a little chubbier and softer, and, uh, and to me he was an enigma. He, he couldn't, I couldn't explain him, and we didn't communicate very well. So I think my mother picked this up and said, take Jim someplace because, you know, you and him are not seeing eye to eye. So my dad said, okay, I'll take him to work. So my dad's about six feet. He always dressed in a white uh, dress shirt with a skinny tie and uh, <clears throat> had on octagon-shaped glasses um, and uh, when he would go to work, um, he would come armed with his slide rule in a holster. And it was about this big. And whenever I asked my dad what he did, he said, I draw straight lines with a ruler, son. I'm a draftsman. Okay, but can you try to, ex if you're a kid, can you explain that to your other friends whose dads are like real things like firemen and policemen, teachers. I could get that, but my dad draws straight lines with a ruler. <laughs> so he worked for uh, North American Aviation in El Segundo, California. I grew up in California. So yeah, good place to be from. <laughs> so. We go to this big park, and we're going to make uh, we're going to make gliders. So, so he works on airplanes. So we go to the meeting, and they talk about the parameters for your glider, and they give you a stack of balsa wood over here, and you go one week, and you you start it to put together, you finish it the next week, and at the end you have a contest to see who stays up the longest. Great building friendship with your dear old dad. So when we go to the meeting, my dad gets out his slide roll, and he starts going like this. And I, I, nobody even knows what a slide roll is anymore, I don't think. But oh, you do good. I didn't. But anyways, this thing he slides up and down, and he has a little thing in the middle that he slides up, and he gets there, and he goes, "Okay, well, gliders have to have dihedral." Okay, what's that? He says, "This. This is dihedral." <laughs> Okay, so sanding away on the, on the little pieces of wood to make the form of the wing and we put it all together and he's got a slide rule out and he figures out where the wings are supposed to go in relation to the nose, how much clay it has to have on the end. And so this thing is now perfection and it's the second Saturday and we're getting ready for the contest. My dad has a pet name for me. He calls me Buster. Well, it's not a friendly name. It seems like everything that I touch gets broken. So Buster is kind of a sarcastic name. And, um, but you know, when you're a kid, you can never let your dad know that he's getting you. And every time he said that, that, that would sear my soul because everybody knows they want to make their dad proud. That's what you do, right? Especially when you're a kid, so seven, Got the plane all ready to go. Me and dad worked on it. Okay, go outside. He says, don't throw the airplane yet because we have a half hour to go until the contest. And I know that if you go out and play with it, it's gonna get broken. Okay, dad. Well, oh, 
seven years old, he got it in your hand, what are you going to do? And it was magnificent. Everybody came over, patted me, how did you do that? Look at it, it's still going. And I was so proud. And then, so I ran, I got it, and I, and I came back, and I tripped and fell over something, and oh no. So the wings broke off. Dad, I'm really sorry. Well, come on, Buster. Let's see if we can fix it. Boy, that shriveled me up, Buster. So anyway, we glued the wings back on, but you know, it takes time for the glue to dry. And so when I went to throw the airplane for the first contest, it didn't fly very long. So consequently, uh, we lost the contest. But they had another contest for the runners-ups, and it was a contest of who could throw the baseball the farthest. I won that. <laughs> so I said, at that point, I decided what I was going to be in my life. I'm going to be a professional baseball player. I yeah, won the contest on who could throw the ball the farthest. For a seven-year-old, that was pretty good. Next year was Little League. So here I am going to these Little League practices. I get to play in some games. They told me I was a pitcher. So I told my dad, I said, you've got to come watch me pitch. Oh, I can't, son. I've I, I got things to do. No dad. So for the next few years, my dad is the mystery man. He's always not there when all the important things in my life, I think they're important. I mean, I'm going to be a professional baseball player. And he's not witnessing this development. I, I think he's being cheated. You know, and I, I try lots of ways to get him to come, and he comes to a few of my games, but most of them he misses. Not good. So high school starts. I'm still going to be a professional baseball player. Go out for the high school baseball team, and I make it. Get hit with a pitch ball, I'm done for the season. And eat. So, okay, so now what am I going to do? So I wanted to let her in a sport, so I went out and I badgered my dad until he bought me a tennis racket. So I went out for tennis. I made the tennis team. <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'll be a professional tennis player. Meanwhile, my dad says, how's your grades? Uh, how important is that? I mean, to a professional ball player. I mean, just get paid for playing ball, right? Do you, do you need to be smart at math? So I'm thinking my dad's not too smart. And he's thinking that I'm not too smart. So anyway, make it through high school. And now we're going to go and we're going to talk to the college uh, or to the high school counselor about going to college. And um, so my dad is very frugal. He's a, he's a child of the Depression. And he tells me on the way over there, he says, I don't know about college. Your grades aren't that good. Let's talk to the counselor and see what he recommends. And I go, OK. So I'm not really all that sold on college either. But there's this thing called the Vietnam War going on. And I, I know that when I graduate from high school, I'm not going to be around for very long. And the draft is going to get me. So college is sounding better and better. So. Um, I, I'm leaning on getting my dad to do the right thing and, 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 and help me uh, get to college. So we talked to, co to the, the high school counselor, and he looks at my grades, and he says, well, you know, uh, college isn't for everybody. Um, I think you're a smart young man. Uh, have you ever thought about maybe being something like a, a lathe operator? What the heck is that? But my dad knew, because he was a draftsman. The pictures that he draws, you know, people make stuff. And he says, yeah, yeah, son, those people have to be really smart. That might be a really good thing for you. We could go send you to a trade school. Oh, wait, wait a minute. That's not my image of becoming a professional baseball player. Is Nobody knows a, 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 a lathe operator. OK, so real quick. So my dad says, we have this deal on the way home. He says, son, I'm not going to invest big money in your college. So what you got to do is you got to prove to me that you're college material. So right down the road, about a mile and a half, is El Camino Junior College. You go two years there, you can live at home. Live at home. OK. So I'm walking to college. I do my two years. 
I go to Long Beach State, the next, the next college in the college system in, in, in Los Angeles, and I'm, I, I, my, I've decided I can't be a professional baseball player anymore because I got out of the real world and found out who the real professional baseball players were, and I wasn't one of them. So I was still not too sure of what I was going to do. So my, 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 my dad says, um, well, uh, what do you want to do? I said, well, I really like history. I'm going to be a history major. And he goes, uh, look, Buster, uh, nobody makes any money with a history degree. What do you plan to do with that? People aren't going to pay you to do that. I said, well, I don't know. So anyway, graduate from college, uh, that draft is after me. I managed to get myself in the Navy to a flight program. And um, all of this stuff I do on my own. I don't try to get any consultation from my dad. And I come home from flight training at um, Christmas time. And my dad says, uh, what airplane are you flying? I said, well, I'm, I'm flying the T-34 Mentor. He goes, oh, OK. And then when I get back, I'm going to fly the T-28 Trojan. Oh, is that a cool airplane? He goes, really? I designed the empennage for that airplane. <laughs> Suddenly, in my whole life, I finally had a bond with dear old dad. He, he and I were now in the same aviation business together, and I didn't even know it. So all this time that I was thinking that my dad was dumb and not paying attention to me, he told me that when he got out of high school, he had to go right to work, and he became the Strassman. And as the aviation business went on, he didn't get to complete his education. So now he was working with people that were PhDs and that sort of thing, and he didn't have a college degree. And so he was going to school at night. That's where he was when I was looking for him. And on weekends, he was driving to UCLA to take those advanced math classes so he could put better food on the table. But I, I, he didn't tell me that. I didn't find it out until a lot later. So the last bit of this thing that really was cool to me, was my dad, when I come home uh, from leave the next time, he says, I got something to show you. He never says that. Uh-oh, what did I do? So I come home. On the kitchen table, he has laid out these plans. I said, what's that? He says, that's the Apollo command module. I'm working on it. I go, oh, wow. So I'm looking at this thing, and I'm looking at my watch at the same time because I got a date. You know how stupid you are when you're a kid and you don't realize somebody's given you this great present and, you, and you're not appreciating it like you're supposed to? I still kick myself. But he, he, he laid out and showed me where everybody was going to sit, how this thing was going to work, what the problems they were having in designing it, and when it was going to happen. And it was like, oh, this is like amazing. And so I came back, got my, got my wings, I made a couple of deployments, ended up in Vietnam a couple of times and I was on my way back and my family hadn't seen me for a while. I'd gotten married. And on the way back they announced, they said, hey, uh, we're looking for a couple of volunteers. So what do they tell you? Never volunteer for anything. But this was something. They said, we're going to do the Apollo 16 recovery. The ship is. And we need a few guys to go out and do the mission that you do. So wh why don't you volunteer? I knew what was going to happen. When I got home, my family was going to kill me. My wife was going to be so upset because I had been gone already for months and months. And then on the way home, I volunteered to be gone again. But I did it because I just had this connection with my dad, and I knew that if I didn't do it, it would be, I would have felt like I made a mistake. So I did it. I uh, got involved with the Apollo 16 recovery. It was an amazing experience. And when I came back, I uh, had a little things to share with my dad that I never had to share before. And um, I'd like to tell you it was worth it. Yeah, it was worth it. Thank you.